Good evening. On behalf of Fairfield University, I would like to welcome you to tonight's Republican gubernatorial debate. I am Dr. Gail Alberta, an assistant professor of politics and public administration here at Fairfield University, as well as the director of Ready to Run Connecticut. Tonight, I have the honor of introducing the ninth president of Fairfield University, Dr. Mark Nemec, who joined Fairfield about this time last year. President Nemec has positioned Fairfield as a model of the modern Jesuit Catholic University committed to lifelong learning, holistic formation, and expansive partnership. In addition to his role as president of Fairfield University, Dr. Nemec joined the politics department within the College of Arts and Sciences as a professor. Please join me in welcoming my colleague and president of Fairfield University, Dr. Mark Nemec. Good evening. As president and professor of politics here at Fairfield University, it is my privilege to welcome you to our Regina A. Quick Center for this Republican gubernatorial primary debate. Fairfield University seeks to be a model of modern excellence for 21st century higher education. As a values-based, student-centric, outcomes-focused, comprehensive university, we embrace our role as a civic institution and recognize the integral importance of engagement beyond our campus. With this in mind, we are honored to be hosting this debate with the CCIC. We greatly value our membership in the Connecticut Conference of Independent Colleges, a collection of 15 independent colleges and university that reflects the rich diversity of the sector in our state. A set of institutions committed to access, affordability, and innovation, and dedicated to the proposition that universities need not be public in charter to be civic in impact. Before I introduce our moderator, I would like to take a moment to thank our sponsors, CCIC, the Connecticut Mirror, Connecticut Public Radio, and NBC Connecticut WVIT for supporting this event. I would also like to thank the Fairfield Department of Politics, along with our students for being here volunteering today, as well as the many members in the marketing department and others who worked to orchestrate today's debate. And with that, let me introduce our moderator for the evening, John Dukowski. John is executive editor of the New England News Collaborative, an eight station consortium of public media newsrooms. He is also the host of Next, a weekly program about New England, and appears weekly on the wheelhouse, WNPR's News Roundtable program. As an editor, he has won national awards for his documentary work and regularly works with NPR and member stations on efforts to collaborate in the public media system. He is also a regular moderator for political debates and has moderated conversations at the Connecticut Forum, the Mark Twain House and Museum, the Harriet Beecher Stowe Center, the World Affairs Council of Connecticut, and the Litchfield Jazz Festival. Please join me in welcoming John Dukowski. Thank you, President Nemec. Uh, thank you for the kind introduction. Thank you all for being here tonight. Uh, thank you to Fairfield University and the Connecticut Conference of Independent Colleges for hosting us. I'm going to go over ground rules for our debate in just a moment, but first let me introduce our panelists who will be asking the questions. Sitting right next to me is Mark Pazniokas of the Connecticut Mirror. Next to him is Vanessa De La Torre of Connecticut Public Radio. And Max Reese of NBC Connecticut. And now let me bring up the candidates, and this is a perfect time for you to applaud for not only your candidate, but all the candidates. So let me welcome first David Stemmerman. Let me welcome next Bob Stefanowski. Steve of Sitnik. <laughs> Ms. 
Tim Herbst. And Mark Bowden. <laughs> I'm so glad you got that out of your system. Uh, the focus of tonight's debate is the Connecticut economy, but as we all know, there is a lot that goes into the economy, so expect a wide-ranging discussion of many topics of importance to our state. This is a cumulative time debate, so each candidate will have a total of 15 minutes of speaking time. At the end, each candidate will also have an additional one minute for a closing statement. My job is to keep the conversation moving along, and we will get the chance to hear from all the candidates about a wide range of issues and answering questions from all of our panelists. I'm going to make sure that each candidate has time to answer each question, but I'll just remind you uh, folks that there is a cumulative clock running, so please be concise with your answers. Uh, if any candidate would like to rebut a statement made during any answer, you can just raise your hand and I'll get to you, and I, I will make sure that I uh, get to you as quickly as possible. Uh, for the audience, you know the drill. Please hold your applause and any other outbursts until the end of the program. Uh, it will help uh, us conduct a, a civil conversation, so thank you very much. Uh, you can, however, tweet about this. Use the hashtag CCICDebate. Uh, we see to the candidates in alphabetical order, and that's the order in which we'll be directing the questions. And the first question comes from Mark Pazniokas. Mark. So I thought we'd start off by asking you guys for a little guidance about how we should be reading all your multi-point plans on the economy, the budget, transportation. Uh, it was very famously said of Donald Trump that um, the media made the mistake of taking him literally but not seriously. So as a group, you, you guys promised to eliminate about half of Connecticut's taxes. You would give the state faster trains and less congested highways, but somehow would do it without asking taxpayers for an additional dime. And uh, at least one of you would also uh, do what no state has been able to do, which is break new legal ground and wriggle out of our very significant pension liability. So my question is, Give us a little help. Should we take your promises literally, or should we view them uh, in, in aspirational terms of a goal that would tell voters the direction you want to go in? And Mark Bowden, that question is to you first. Of course it is. Um, <laughs> thank you. Um, I th can't comment on anybody else's plan. I can only tell you this, that we know what has done us wrong. It's the Democrats controlling the legislature over the last 35 to 40 years. So we know the path that we're not supposed to take. We get that. The question is what path should we take to get the outcomes that all of us want for our Connecticut? At the end of the day, this is our state. And so all of us have to be part of the solutions and being able to make this state the place that it once was, what I call the envy of New England. So when you look at my plan, uh, this sets a tone. It sets a direction as to where we plan on going. Whether we talk about phasing out the state income tax over 10 years, whether we talk about eliminating specific tax, whether we talk about criminal justice reforms, whatever we do within there, within that plan, it's a rough cut and a rough sketch to get us where we want to go. Ultimately, all of us have a responsibility to get off the path that we're on. It is not working. We've had zero growth since 1991 and negative growth since 2004. So if you go to my website, Bowton2018.com, you can read that plan, and it continues to grow. It's not a, a static plan. It's a, an active plan that will continue to grow as more ideas come up and as people suggest ideas. This isn't a case of where I have all the right ideas for the entire state. This is about all of us having all the ideas for the entire state. Tim Herbst. Really appreciate that as the initial question because it really goes to the core of the decision that Republican primary voters will have to make on August 14th. They're going to have to ask which plan adds up, which plan makes sense, and which plan recognizes the practicality and the severity of the situation we are currently in. In 1990, Lowell Weicker told us that the income tax would be like gasoline on an open flame. And in 1994, John Rowan promised to eliminate the income tax. And at that time, the budget deficits and the unfunded liabilities were nowhere near what they are now. So I'm of a school of thought that feels very strongly very strongly, and this is one of the differences in this campaign. 
that we are not going to be able to cut or eliminate any taxes unless and until we deal with the 86 billion pound gorilla in the room. The $86 billion in unfunded pension and retiree health care liabilities. Unfunded liability is code language for future tax increases. It is going to mean that this state's budget deficit will continue, and over the last decade we have been in protracted and sustained deficit. It's going to mean further cuts to municipal services, educational aid, social service programs. It's going to be the new economic reality in Connecticut that directly impacts people. So here's where I'm a little different. I say we have to dig out of the hole first, and in a very meaningful and structural way, bring the kinds of changes that other states have brought to get these unfunded liabilities under control using every statutory and legal remedy at law, and more importantly, truly balancing our budget. And once we do that, the tax cuts and relief that I'm talking about make sense. Stop the hemorrhaging, eliminate the estate tax, stop people from leaving here, eliminate the social security tax, tax on retirement income, gift tax, reduce the corporate rates to show businesses that we are not crazy here. Work to eliminate the income tax for those people making $75,000 or less to truly lift up the people that are feeling the impacts of Damaloy's economy. But more importantly, simplify the code with a plan to reduce the income tax. But folks, we're not going to be able to eliminate a tax that accounts for 55% of total revenues unless and until we deal with this $86 billion problem in a meaningful and structural way. Uh, yeah, thank you for having me here and uh, hosting this debate, Fairfield University. Um, Scott Walker, when he stepped into the chair in, Wis in Wisconsin, the governor's chair, their pension fans were, uh, plans were funded about 39 cents on the dollar. Now into his, I forget his third or fourth term now, they're funded at 99%. Charlie Baker has taken the income tax of Massachusetts from 5.5 down to 4%. So sometimes the distance from impossible to possible is much shorter than we think it is if you have the right leadership and the right will to address a problem. Look, in the, in the business world, I was always taught, you say what you're going to do, you say what is the outcome, and you say how long is it going to take you to get there. That's what stakeholders and shareholders want from you. So that's why my plan is a very detailed, specific plan, a five-step plan to building 300,000 jobs over the next eight years. Five plus three equals eight. So it's not a framework. It is a goal that we have to get to, because since I graduated from college, this state has only created 5,600 total net new jobs. So how do we do it? Day one, step one, targeted tax reform. I'm not living in the fantasy world of getting rid of the, the um, income tax, which is 50% of our revenue, because I'm an engineer. I'm a nuclear engineer, electrical engineer, and I'm an MBA, and I'm a Republican, so I like a dirty word called math, okay? So day one, targeted tax reform. I will give back 5% of the taxes to people, seniors. I want to hug seniors, get rid of the estate tax, stop taxing Social Security and pension. I want to hug working people, give them a tax cut from 5.5% down to 4%, and eliminate over a three-year period the corporate tax and tax on LLCs. And that accounts for, in year one, 5% of our revenue. As I do that, step two is I look for $3.5 billion of detailed spending cuts, which is in my plan. It includes addressing the pensions. It looks at uh, consolidating entities within government. And we can do that together with the legislature, or I have a plan that I can do it with my direct reports working together. And step three, what we have to do is build career corridors in Connecticut, day one, and I'll talk about more of that tonight. How we have to inspire ourselves to build not one Roosevelt Island, but dream for three Roosevelt Islands here so we can turn the moving vans around, get our kids and ourselves retrained for the jobs that are here for today, and we can't see that to Massachusetts or Rhode Island. So it's great to be back. I graduated from uh, this university in 1984. Uh, I don't think this building was actually here, but uh, uh, I think I'm a good example of the value of a Jesuit education. Um, I left Fairfield. I had a job within 90 days up at uh, Price Waterhouse in Hartford. I was a senior guy at General Electric, one of the top 50 people in a company with 300,000 employees. And I was a CFO of U.S. Investment Bank where I had a $500 billion business over 35 countries. Um, I have made a career out of doing things people said I couldn't do. Um, not only can we get rid of this state income tax, we have to get rid of this state income tax. It's always amazing to me that people say you can't do it. Well, we actually already did it. 
Before 1991, this state did not have an income tax. And you know what? We were the fastest growing state in the entire nation. Since Lowell Weicker put this tax in in 1991, we've been one of the slowest in economic growth. I'm not saying it's going to be easy. It's not going to be easy. But what people want for our next governor is somebody who's going to say what's possible, not somebody who's going to say what's impossible. Not someone who's going to put up a lot of excuses about why things can't be done. And we're going to fund this tax cut by ripping cost out of this state like you've never seen. We're going to start with resizing government. At UBS, I had every single department come in. I said, I don't care what was in your budget last year. This year, it's zero. And we're only going to add back in what you absolutely have to have. We ripped a billion dollars of cost out of UBS in my first 12 months. We're going to restructure CBAC. We have to do it. We're not going to find $100 billion in the next 10 years. It's not fair to the people that are in the unions. Those checks are going to bounce. And it's too big a drain on this economy. We need to reform the entitlement system. We need to take care of people that need it, but we need to do it in an equitable, responsible, and fiscally disciplined way. We need to reprioritize. What does this government do? We, we build a busway from New Britain to Hartford <laughs> that nobody uses. Instead of investing that money in education, investing that money in infrastructure, and investing it where it needs to be. And finally, we need to revitalize our cities. And that doesn't mean subsidizing Hartford with hundreds of millions of dollars by guaranteeing their debt. That means making the tough decisions about how we're going to get out of this fiscal problem in all of our big cities so that kids like my daughters, 24, 19, and 15, want to stay. So can we do it? Absolutely. We're going to rip cost out. We're going to use those cost savings to fund or an elimination of the state income tax over eight years. That's going to spur economic growth. That's going to drive jobs. That's going to stop the exodus of people out of this state. Florida has done it, budget surplus. Tennessee has done it, budget surplus. Texas has done it, budget surplus. Anyone who stands up here today and tells you can't do it isn't a true leader, doesn't have a vision, and doesn't have the experience to do it. We're absolutely going to do it for the state of Connecticut. Thank you. Mark, thanks very much for the question. Uh, rather than going through a lot of the details of the plan, I want to get to the, the notion of what that question is about, which is what should we make of a plan? What does it speak to you about your leadership style? I think there are three things that are important about your plan and how realistic it is that is important for what you're looking for in your next leader. The first one is, is it an honest and realistic plan? In any relationship that I've had from my wife and mar married for 20 years to the business that I started, you need to begin with an honest set of facts, something that you believe that you can do. And that means a willingness to speak about what is possible, what is not possible, and to speak about the truth. This state has an extraordinary challenge ahead of it in these massive unfunded retirement liabilities. Where we began in outlining our plan, and I had an opportunity to sit down with you, Mark, and with Keith, and we talked about this challenge in great detail. And you raised some very important questions about what's legally possible, what's financially possible. And what I said to you at that time, and I say to you today, is there's nothing that I've put in that plan that I don't believe can be done and must be done. And so it's very important as we begin to discuss the challenges of our state that we speak about them honestly from a foundation of trust. The second thing is we need to have the details of how we could actually get them to work. One of the memories I have uh, growing up of the movie, uh, The Candidate, is uh, Robert Redford at the end of uh, winning a uh, Senate race uh, turns to his campaign manager and he says, so what do we do now? And the concern I have is yes, we've got a lot of wonderful aspirations about cutting taxes, cutting spending, getting jobs growing, but we have a tremendous task ahead of us of what do we do now. And so in terms of cutting taxes, I view that we have to cut taxes. I grew up in Newton, Massachusetts when it was called Taxachusetts, and we were losing families and businesses just like we are here today. But what we said is we need to have a plan that is detailed, that we outline $3 billion of tax cuts, how we're going to pay for it with $2 billion of spending cuts, and a billion dollars of revenue offsets so you can believe in it. 
The last is what I think is critical, is we need to have a plan that is aspirational, that's going to bring us together, that will not only win a primary, but will win a general. And when we think about how we're going to attract people from all over the state, we have aspirations like getting our trains from New York City to Stanford in 30 minutes, Bridgeport in 45, and New Haven in 60. We have aspirations to make our schools and workforce the most productive on Earth. And we've outlined the plans behind it. The last thing I'd say is if you don't believe me on it, I'm very pleased to have earned the endorsement of the Hartford Current, the support of Kevin Rennie, who doesn't have a lot of positive things to say about much of anybody. And I'm very glad to have heard uh, a few positive things that he had to say about us. Uh, and so I'm proud of the plan we've put up. You can see it on davidstemmerman.com, our website. I look forward to discussing it in greater detail over the course of the evening. Barring any rebuttals that people want to make, I'll, I'll turn the next question to, to Vanessa De La Torre, uh, who will ask the question first of Tim Herbst. Thanks, John. So Hartford was mentioned a little bit earlier. A city like Hartford has deep structural problems. There's housing segregation, poverty, debt, and a small tax base. Those are some of the issues. Hartford's also home to big companies that are important to Connecticut's economy. We all know that the state bailed out, bailed out Hartford this year so the city wouldn't file for bankruptcy. But say you're the governor. Would you let the capital city go bankrupt? Well, I appreciate that question. I spent four years of my life as a student in Hartford at Trinity College. And I think about the Hartford that I knew when I was a student at Trinity and the Hartford today, and I am embarrassed and ashamed as a Connecticut resident that our capital city is on the brink of bankruptcy. I get asked this question a lot on the campaign trail. And people say to me, Tim, would you support the bailout or would you allow the city to go bankrupt? I would not do either. Here's what I would do. I would do what was done 20 minutes up the road in Springfield, Massachusetts, when Mitt Romney was the governor of Massachusetts. The state of Massachusetts said, by legislative action, that they were going to bring in a financial control board and give that board actual legal authority to make financial decisions on behalf of the city and to make labor management decisions on behalf of the city. Here's my problem with the bailout. It is a hallmark of the last eight years. We have a governor and a legislature that consistently punish good behavior and reward bad behavior. And when I talk about that bad behavior, I'm not talking about the hardworking citizens of Hartford. I'm talking about the elected leaders over several years that have kicked the can and made decisions that were based upon the next election and not the next generation. We need qualified people to go into Hartford to take the politics out of the situation, to give that city the tough pill of medicine it requires to make the structural changes that are necessary to get the capital city back on track. There's a reason why businesses are leaving the city of Hartford. There's a reason why people are leaving the city of Hartford. Because the mill rate is simply unsustainable and the taxes are simply unsustainable in Hartford for businesses to continue to stay there for the long term or come to our state to make a new investment. So if I'm elected governor, that is the course of action that I will suggest to the legislature that they take. It is time to give Hartford the tough pill of medicine it requires. And it is time to send a message to all of our cities that we have to manage our budgets responsibly, appropriately. We can't kick the can on pension liabilities, and we can't consistently go to the taxpayers of Connecticut looking for bailouts. It starts with a top-down approach that really focuses on true fiscal reform. This is about restoring fiscal stability to our state, to our cities, to our towns. And what's happened over the last eight years, and we saw in this last budget, is when Dan Malloy wanted to take a third of the teachers' pension costs and jam them down on towns. It was a tactic to soak up the rainy day funds in the towns of this state that have been operated well. That is rewarding good or penalizing good behavior. We have to go after and encourage people to run rainy day funds and be independent on their own. In our cities, Yes, there is an out-migration from Connecticut. It's been going on for a while, and it's been going on because we're overtaxed, and we drive businesses out, and young people out, and we need to rethink how we actually build an ecosystem so that people can build a career here, build a family here, and retire with dignity. So when it comes to a city, I, I believe that every entity has to stand on their own. And we had a saying in the Navy, it's not what you expect, it's what you inspect. And when you inspect how pension liabilities have been built up in overtime and other tactics over time, it is just not the right behavior, and we need to drive our towns and cities to be efficient. 
And there are reasons, as I said, people migrating out of the state. And that's why we have to look at initiatives like what I proposed, building a Roosevelt Island project here in Connecticut, where we anchor applied research universities with our businesses that are still here and rebuild our cities, because the cities have to be our future, which will attract young people for jobs that are here. Because we have to grow that tax base, again, within our cities. But it doesn't start with going and taxing the hardworking people of Connecticut and doing a bailout. We should have addressed the root cause of the problem that Hartford has a spending problem. And that's what has to be addressed. This is the perfect example of how a politician approaches a problem versus how a business person approaches a problem. I went to the board of GE once, Jack Walsh was there, and we had a troubled company. I asked for $50 million to turn it around. And I talked for about an hour, and at the end of it, Jack said, you know what, you're going to get it. He said, but there's certain strings attached. He said, you outlined your plan. I want toll gates. I want milestones every 30 days. I don't want you coming back asking for money. This is it. This is all you're going to get. And by the way, if you don't turn it around, you're fired. What does a politician do? They go to Hartford, they say, well, let's throw some money at it, make the problem go away for two years until I get reelected, and then we'll worry about it later. Let's subsidize the bonds of Hartford and have Connecticut's debt rating go down, Hartford debt rating go up, and we get zero concessions from the bondholders. This is the problem with politicians. We need to start running this state like a business. Forget about the moral problems of it, where we're rewarding bad behavior by people in Hartford that are doing the wrong things, politicians in Hartford. But just from a pure business perspective, I wouldn't be against trying to save Hartford, but I've yet to see a plan that actually gets it into a recovery mode. And I think, unfortunately, we're probably at the point where we need to file it for bankruptcy. Look at Detroit. It's coming out the other end. Our kids need vibrant cities, but the way to do it is not to throw good money after bad. And by the way, we better start looking at Hartford, Bridgeport, New Haven, and Waterbury, because any city with a mill rate of over 40 is essentially bankrupt. That's why we need a business person to come in here, address some of these issues, make the tough decisions, stop wasting money. And you know what you can do with some of that money you saved that you're not wasting it? Fund a tax cut. That's what we need to do in this state. So Bob, I share your approach here that having accountability and having a real plan is the right approach here. I share the view on of just about everything that we've heard uh, on, on stage. Uh, the challenge that we have in Hartford is in some ways, uh, uh, it's, a, it's on a small scale what we have for the state as a whole. It's runaway spending, but critically, it's also these significant unfunded retirement liabilities. And when we move forward and try to address them for the state as a whole, we're going to have to have that same conversation with your, our municipalities. Because if we fix it at the state level and we don't at our cities, we're going to have this problem uh, continue and fester. Uh, in terms of rewarding good ba behavior or bad, I've got five children. If I went and bailed them out each time they had a problem, uh, it would be a real problem for them and for our home. And so having accountability and standards is good for everyone. Last thought just in terms of the importance of our cities. It's important for us to have healthy, vital, vibrant cities. It's important for the communities that surround them. We have on Fairfield, just at the border of Bridgeport, uh, it shouldn't be such a stark contrast as it is today. And so some of the key ideas that we have in terms of building transportation infrastructure, how we revitalize our schools, are going to be very important for making our cities the vibrant places that they can and should be. Well, as somebody who runs a successful city every day, I always like to point out that I don't have a boardroom to report to as mayor. I have 85,000 residents and another 25,000 residents that come into work every day in the city of Danbury. They are my bosses. And they vote with their feet. If they don't like what they're seeing, they're gone. Because that's just the world that we live in today. So to answer your question, do I think Hartford should have been allowed to go bankrupt or should have gone bankrupt, the answer to that is yes. Because in my job and what I do, I hold people accountable, we set goals, and we assess how well we're doing towards those goals on a weekly and bi-weekly basis with my department heads. I always have a saying. That saying is don't come to me with the problem. Walk in the store with a solution. A solution for Hartford is not to build a baseball stadium. That's a really bad idea, particularly when you're facing the kind of debt and the stressors that they have on their economy. I get it. It's a quality of life thing. 
but on your list of needs and wants, that really is not ranking very high. In addition to that, you have to hold the elected officials in those communities accountable. You can't have employees. For example, in my city, we have 21 city council people. 21. We have one person that serves as a staff person to all those 21 people. She makes about $52,000, $53,000 a year. In Hartford, every single council person gets a staff person, and they make $80,000 a year. We're 44 square miles. They're about 16 square miles. Bad decision. Look how much they pay their registrars. Registrar of voters, important position. Very close to $90,000 a year. Bad decision. So my point is that if the political leaders in the community won't make the tough decisions because there's just too much politics involved and they want to get elected another time, then we need to let them go bankrupt and say, look, you made your bed, now you got to sleep in it. If we run in there and try to buy everybody out of their problems, they're just going to do it over and over and over again. There are solutions to healthy cities. Some of it is transit-oriented development. We talked a little bit about that. That helps spur growth within the inner parts of the city. In addition to that, uh, I think Hartford and New Haven can make an argument for pilot money, which is a, a real problem in terms of uh, entities that don't pay property taxes within their city. But it all starts with the leadership at the top, and Hartford has had failed leadership for literally decades, and that's why they're in the mess that they're in. The city of Danbury has a mill rate of 27. We're 159th in spending out of all the city and towns in Connecticut. That's good leadership, and that's how you assess performance on a daily basis. If no one has a rebuttal. This is all very civilized, by the way. Thank you, gentlemen. It's mm -hmm. very, dare I say, public radio of you in the, in the way that you're conducting this, so thank you. Um, Max, you've got the next question. It'll go first to Steve of Sydney. Uh, we're sticking with the theme of cities for the moment. Um, during the most recent RFP process for Amazon's HQ2, Connecticut provided five separate proposals and all of them focused around the state's cities. Stamford, Danbury, Waterbury, Hartford, and a joint bid from New Haven and Bridgeport none of which were announced as finalists. Considering how dependent those cities are, in many cases, in, on state government, what kind of message does that result send to the state and the cities on the way they conduct business? It says we gotta do better. Um, look, the first requirement in that Amazon RFP, the first thing was a stable and friendly business environment. That was the first requirement they asked for. So. It didn't make sense for any Connecticut town or city or state to submit uh, a proposal because we are not stable and friendly business environment. That's why we have to, in my five-step plan, look at bringing down taxation specifically on corporations. We will have businesses flocking from Massachusetts and New York here around that. Step three in my plan, we need to get the cholesterol out of Connecticut to forming businesses. Connecticut needs to take a big fat Lipitor. It's too complicated to start a business to run a business. It's easier to do it across the border in Massachusetts. And you know, if, you've, if the politicians, and we've been led by career politicians for 40 years in Connecticut, so they always view more government as the solution. But when you come in from an outsider's perspective, with a business perspective, but also, in my background, I've built software systems at the federal, state, and local level for um, DMVs. I was talking to a gentleman the other day who lives in Connecticut. He did the application for the state of Indiana, a one-stop shop online that basically you go there and it deals on the back end with all the various departments you've got to go to. Day one, we have to work with solutions to bring that in. So, that's why I believe we've got to start hugging cu our customers here first, seniors, working folks, and businesses, before we're ever going to earn the right to bring an Amazon here. Because you will not bring a customer here until the current customers of Connecticut start talking to their friends and saying, this is a great place to do business. And I'll tell you a quick story. I was on with a manufacturer from Italy, Aerospace. Someone wanted me to talk to him, convince him to come to Connecticut. I called him up and I said, how about Connecticut? And he said, ABC. I said, well, what does that mean? He goes, anywhere but Connecticut. Now, if an Italian manufacturer is thinking that, we, ha we should be hugging our aerospace industry here, making them raving fans of Connecticut, so when that guy hears from someone in two or three years, he's going to want to come to Connecticut. Yeah, I think the problem is it's not a fair fight. Um, Amazon comes, they go up to Massachusetts, they meet with Charlie Baker. That's somebody who's actually run a business before. 
They come to Connecticut. Who do they meet with? Dan Malloy. They never, the guy's never run a jo had a job in his life. When the last meeting with GE, Dan Malloy came out just up the road to Fairfield to meet with Jeff Mo. Please, please, please stay. We don't want you to go. We love you. We spent a lot of time looking at you. He hands out a PowerPoint presentation. On the first page of the presentation is a picture of a jet engine. It's a Pratt & Whitney jet engine, not a GE jet engine. <laughs> That's what we're dealing with in government, ladies and gentlemen. How do you expect to attract business when the CEO is meeting with someone that's never had a real job. It's not gonna happen. Look at what Trump's done for this national economy. Somebody who knows how to negotiate. Somebody who knows how to put America first. Somebody who's actually worked in the real world. It's not a fair fight. I won't even get off on a tangent on how our tax policy and regulatory policy makes it impossible for anybody to come here anyway. But it starts with that first discussion. You gotta have a business person on the other side of the table. It's just never going to happen without it. So, Max, thanks for the question. This is a nice elaboration for what uh, Mark asked earlier. Yeah, we all share the same outline of what we want to get accomplished. But, again, let's go down to the details of how would you actually do it. Uh, so, yeah, the situation for Amazon, very similar to GE. So I spent time talking with the guys at GE because we announced our campaign at Fairfield outside their headquarters. I wanted to understand what's going on here. And so they left because of these massive unfunded retirement liabilities that led to tax increase after tax increase. So if we're going to be on anyone's list of consideration, we need to have a detailed plan of how to resolve these retirement liabilities. On our plan, our plan on our website, talks about we can't reform them, we must restructure them. And we have a very detailed plan where we talk about doing things here that are modeled after the private sector. Look at what happened to the big three auto companies after they went bankrupt. It was effectively a one-time buyout. I was just in Glastonbury with a person who works for Prudential Financial Services. The counterparty for the retirees for GM is now Prudential Financial Services. That's the model that we've outlined. It would be novel for state but it has been done in the private sector, that's what we're proposing here. In terms of making our cities vibrant, having a transportation infrastructure is vital. So I spoke with the guys at, at uh, GE, they said, you know, we can't get any millennials who live in the city to come work here because it takes just too long on the trains and obviously the roads are a complete non-starter. So again, but what are you gonna do about it? We have a plan to attract billions of dollars of private investment so that we can not just talk about it, we can do something about it. And the last piece is we need to have a workforce that is needed by these, uh, these advanced companies. So for uh, Amazon, you need people in programming. You need people with STEM skills. Our state is 27th in the country in per capita STEM graduates. We need to bring businesses and educators together. In Massachusetts, it's not just that they have business people there, they have a plan of what to do. And one of the things that those business people had a plan to do was to bring businesses and educators together. That is why from places like Springfield, uh, you can go to work in a career in technical school as early as age 14. It is why you have in Cambridge, Massachusetts, a vibrant biotech industry. Again, what I ask for you is not just focusing on the headlines and the sound bites, focus on the details and the solutions. Thank you. Um, as a city that participated in that process, I, I do have to tell you it was a good exercise for us to do an inventory, if you will, of all the positive things that we have in our city and in the surrounding greater Danbury area. So I have no regrets in participating in that. And I just want to tell you something. We did the entire PowerPoint video package that Amazon required. It cost us about $6,600. The state of Connecticut spent $60,000 on its video alone. So clearly, obviously, there's issues with terms of how them even be able to execute a presentation. But I will say also that you can't send the message that you're open for business when your rest stops are closed. People come into the state, the first thing they see is, welcome to Connecticut. Sorry, rest stop's closed. So the message that we send each and every day is horrendous uh, for those people that want to come here, stay here, invest here, or even engage in tourism here. And finally, I, I, I would say to you that if somehow we landed the great white whale of Amazon, my biggest fear was not the city of Danbury's permitting process, because we would have moved that through within a matter of months. The state of Connecticut would have left us hanging for four years before they figured out how to actually approve any kind of project that size. So permitting is a huge issue here in the state, and it's a huge issue 
for our companies when they decide whether or not to come here and whether they want to deal with the mounds and mounds of bureaucracy. That's why we proposed a one-stop permit center. So you can go where decision makers are and walk in with all of your particular plans and be able to get a response immediately from the state about what we're looking for. So you don't have to wait for years to get something done. And then finally, well, I believe we need a robust economic development outreach program, not just in Connecticut, but across the country, and of course, on a worldwide basis. Let's not forget our small and medium-sized businesses. That's where we see the greatest amount of job growth, they're the largest amount of employers, and they are the people that have been put off the most by the current economic business climate in this state. Let's invest in them, let's partner with them, let's help them create more jobs. One of the best things I ever did in the city of Danbury was create an innovation center where young people come down and develop and build businesses there and then go out on their own and, and rent space because we invested in their ideas and their thoughts. That has made a difference and has employed people with viable jobs and that have been able to go out and invest back into the community. The question you asked about Amazon reminds me about a tour I took about a year ago of a business in South Windsor that employs roughly 500 people. It's a good business, they treat their employees well, they want to stay here in Connecticut, but they're feeling the squeeze. Not only the high taxes, but the oppressive regulatory environment in our state that discourages entrepreneurs, job creators, and business owners to start a business and grow a business. And I asked them this question. I said, how many times have you spoken to somebody from the Department of Economic and Community Development? And they said, once. I said, how many times have you spoken to the governor of the state of Connecticut? They said they had never had. And then I asked them, how many times have another, another governor from another state contacted you about coming to their state? And the business responded to me, Governor Charlie Baker has called us three times. And Mike Pence, when he was the governor of Indiana, running for vice president, found the time to call this business and ask them to come to Indiana. We have to stop playing prevent defense. We have to go on offense. And if we're going to attract businesses here and make Connecticut competitive, it's not only dealing with the unfunded pension liabilities and truly balancing our budget. It is reducing taxes. It is cutting spending. It is taking on the oppressive regulatory environment of the state, which causes ancillary costs and fees that are onerous on business owners and job creators. It's investing in infrastructure. Businesses aren't going to want to come here if their employees are going to be spending three hours a day going to and from work. Our roads, our highways, and our bridges are antiquated, and they are in need of massive overhaul and reform. We need to invest in our cities. We need transit-oriented development. We need to give our millennials cities that they want to live in. And quite frankly, with South southwestern Connecticut being an economic engine for the rest of the state of Connecticut, we need commercial airport uh, availability into southwestern Connecticut to offset where Bradley is located. We have to do these things because guess what? Charlie Baker is doing these things in Massachusetts, investing in infrastructure, cutting regulation, making the taxes more affordable and competitive. That is what we have to do. But it's going to take somebody with the fortitude and the chops to go up to Hartford and say, we are turning the page, the last eight years are in the rearview mirror, we're moving forward, and we're focusing on a new Connecticut. Thank you very much. And the next question uh, is from Mark Pazniotis. The suburbs. Um, you all have expressed a willingness, if not an eagerness, to show some tough love to uh, Hartford. Uh, how about the suburbs? And what I'm talking about is the barriers to affordable housing and to, and to de integrated housing in the suburbs. Only 20 of Connecticut's 169 cities and towns allow multifamily housing, which by the way is defined as anything three or more units um, as a matter of right under zoning. Uh, Two dozen bar it outright, and the rest allow uh, multifamily housing only by special permit. So uh, there's a couple questions packed into that. Do you think that's a problem that as governor you need to tackle? And what would you consider as a solution? There was a, there was a proposal in the General Assembly that passed one house that would have put some pressure on these suburbs that don't allow any multifamily housing to change their zoning. I think I'm first, right? I think you're first. Thank you for that. <laughs> you live um, in a suburb, go for it. So 
as part of this process running for governor, you get to a lot of different cities and towns. And I would tell you 95, 96% of the towns I visit do an infinitely better job of managing their finances than the city of Hartford does. And I believe in supply and demand. I believe in local autonomy. I think the best thing the next governor can do is to provide certainty to the towns, not ripping the ground under, under from them uh, middle of the year and, and changing funding for education. Uh, we need to stop the unfunded mandates. Um, we need to give the power back to the towns and cities to treat the people in their cities, in, in their towns, the best way they feel necessary. Mandates coming out of Hartford, quotas coming out of Hartford, I don't agree with. Like I said, most of these towns do an amazing job of managing themselves. Let them manage. Let them decide the answer to the problem. Can I just ask a quick follow-up, though? Does, does that mean, though, that in perpetuity, the problems of the cities will stay in the cities if the suburbs are not asked to, to bear some of the burden, perhaps, of, say, affordable housing? I don't, we talked about it earlier. I don't agree with rewarding bad behavior in, in the city of Hartford and, and pulling money out of, out of towns uh, to subsidize bad behavior. What I do think the answer is fundamentally changed economic policy in the state of Connecticut, which is lower taxes, lower corporate rates, bring jobs in, and that's gonna help the city of Bridgeport as much as it's gonna help the city of Greenwich. Fundamentally revising the tax policy to get this economy moving, which is why I'm gonna get rid of the state income tax, reduce the corporate tax, and it's gonna rise all the boats in this, in this uh, state. Thank you. My thoughts on this topic is broadly, I uh, agree with Bob that having local control of these issues is generally the preferred approach. I think in addition, we're facing uh, towns all over this state are facing increased financial pressure from a combination of two factors. The first is that we have these uh, we have a budget deficit that is constantly preventing us from uh, providing the support to towns. As I go all around the state, I hear they each year they don't know uh, what kind of support they're going to get, and the, the rug is pulled out from under them at the last moment. In addition, these unfunded mandates are driving up the costs of doing business throughout our towns so that they don't have the ability to do what they need to do. And it's a problem that's quite broad. It's not only the towns, it's for providing social services all throughout the state. We need to get our house in order uh, in a general sense that allows us, whether it be in our towns or in our nonprofits, to take care of those who are most vulnerable. Do, do you consider these zoning issues a problem in the suburbs, that, that the suburbs do not have to take on the same type of housing needs that the cities do? I do not. Thank you. Mark Bowden? I get it. Nobody wants to answer the question. Um, I get it. We're sitting in Fairfield, surrounded by suburbs. People are afraid to stand up what they think is right. I understand. Look, um, for those communities that are willing to, to raise their hand and say, we want to participate in some way, large or small, in providing workforce housing or senior housing, which takes many different shapes, or even veterans housing, we ought to work with them and allow them to do that. I certainly don't want to disallow a community that, is, uh, that has made choices about the kind of community they want to be in terms of zoning. I don't want the state coming in to override them. There should be a local decision made locally. But I've seen it happen and work very well. I've gone to my local COG, and we work closely, that's our council of governments, at being able to cite specific housing around the region, not just in Danbury, to be able to take some of the pressure, some of the load off of Danbury, but do it in a way that's effective, that works, and that also helps people get closer to work to reduce congestion on the highways. Danbury's Main Street was just recently ranked as one of the top 10 Main Streets in the state of Connecticut this week. And the reason for that was because we've embraced market rate housing on our Main Street. We just completed 370 units of all private finance market rate units. Now we're on another project of 170 units, all privately financed market rate units. Those units host people that have discretionary disposable income to spend up and down our Main Street, and we see businesses starting up and flourishing and beginning. That's strategic, and that's allowing people to be able to take advantage in many ways of our zoning, but also to work as their partner and saying, we don't want it here, we want it here. It works better here. And I think we can do that, but we can't do it from a top-down model. It's got to be a local decision made at the local uh, boards uh, and uh, commissions. 
I'll also say that um, those uh, opportunities, when driven locally, have been successful uh, in our area. And I'm proud of the fact that those commu some communities did raise their hand and said, yeah, you know, we think we can accommodate a senior housing project that is over 55 and will allow people to uh, be able to live there. But it's all been based on uh, their local decision. You know, I think this question goes to the core of when you are a governor and you're dealing with public policy issues affecting housing, and by extension, you're affecting people's lives, and it is more than just a balance sheet. And I can tell you that I began my career in public service on the Planning and Zoning Commission, had the honor and privilege of serving as its chair. And one of the things that I learned is that our current laws in the state of Connecticut regarding affordable housing aren't providing affordable housing to those that need it. If I'm elected governor of the state of Connecticut, I will repeal 8-30G of the Connecticut General Statutes, which has been a money maker for developers in the name of so-called affordable housing that has not provided affordable housing to those that need it. And instead, I'm going to insist that we tell our towns and cities in Connecticut that you come up with the plan that makes sense to provide affordable housing to millennials, affordable housing to people that are on fixed incomes, affordable housing to seniors that want to age in place. I found at the local level that we were able to do that, not only in uh, multi-unit housing that uh, gave our millennials an opportunity to save money to buy their, their starter home, but also 55 and older housing for our seniors. Let local governments come up with plans that make the best sense for their towns and cities. Defer to local control. This is one of these laws that has been on the books for 25 years in the state of Connecticut. It hasn't achieved the desired outcome. It has been used as a zone-busting tool to usurp local control. And if I'm elected governor, I will insist on laws that provide truly affordable housing to those that need it while relying upon local control to do it. Thank you. Steve, sit back. Yeah, the reality is we're a state of gaps. We have an achievement gap. We have an income gap, and we have a skills gap. And I agree, 830G has been more of a tool for developers to work around a system to make more money than to drive affordable housing. And I've been thinking a lot about this, and I, tonight I'll tell you, this is one of the hardest things that I have talked to people around the state, and I don't have a silver bullet for. And I'm spending a lot of time thinking about it. But I'll tell you about someone who opened my eyes, and I, I think it comes down to this. It comes back to making, pe you know, allowing people in towns to be more innovative, to come up with their own solutions. In the town of Fairfield, gentlemen in the audience today, a few years ago, I was talking about my, my um, career corridors and how we can focus around healthcare delivery as a center of excellence. Like, wh why don't we think as a state that we can create a center of excellence for senior living in the state of Connecticut? Sounds crazy, right? Every day for the next 20 years, 10,000 people are going to retire. Every day for the next 20 years. As a business person, I view that as a market opportunity. So in talking to this individual, they said Fairfield's already ahead of this trend. We're trying to create you know, multiple family housing options for seniors to attract seniors into downtown Fairfield. We're rethinking transit so we can have seniors you know, get around safely. How do we tie in lifelong learning with Fairfield University's Sacred Heart? Because in all of that, seniors are charitable, seniors pay taxes, seniors are a jobs project, employing home health aides and others. So we need to bring different innovation models, and that's been my background as a high-tech job creator, around trends of where this state is going, and ride these trends, and then find ways to drive innovation through people in Fairfield and New Canaan's looking at this model, and Westport and other towns around here. Let's encourage creativity so we can attract uh, models that allow for millennials and seniors and, uh, and other folks across the spectrum of low income up to people who are empty nesters who want to downsize and stay in our communities. But it should be driven by the towns. It shouldn't be put, we shouldn't be put in a headlock by Dan Malloy over something like 830G. Thank you all for your answers. And uh, Vanessa, you got the next question. Yeah. So millennials, um, the <laughs> workforce is getting older and millennials don't seem all that impressed with what Connecticut has to offer. New York City and Boston get all the attention with their major sports and entertainment. Let's look ahead to five years from now. What investments or actions would you have taken as governor to convince millennials that our state is a fun place to work hard and play hard? And please be specific. Thanks. Sure. So not everyone can afford to live in Soho or Back Bay. 
And so what we've seen in this country is, yes, millennials prefer to live in an urban environment, but they also need to have a place that's affordable where they can start a family. And whether it is in New Haven or Norwalk, uh, or whether it is in some of our more rural communities uh, up in the northwestern part of our state, or even in the Groton area, there are places where you can get a start. What's important for them, though, is they need two things. One is they need the opportunity to get a good job. And so all that we've been talking about in terms of creating a better employment opportunity for the state as a whole is critical. People are leaving this state because they literally can't find a job. Two out of the three graduates of Fairfield University are going to leave because they can't find a job here. The second thing is we need to do a much better job making sure that those millennials who are here have the skills that they need to make a transition to the workplace. So if you go to manufacturers all over the state, and we have tremendous opportunities for new employment, 16,000 jobs at Electric Boat in Groton, 10,000 jobs for Pratt & Whitney assembling jet engines. All too often we have our students finishing school without the requisite skills. We need to bring business and educators together for places like Platt Technical School, Goodwin uh, uh, College, so that they learn the skills that they need so that they can earn a good living here. And the last thing is, people do want entertainment. They want to be able to get somewhere. Well, if we have our roads as among the most congested in the country, if we have trains that are slower than they were in 1970, we're not going to be able to get to New York or to Boston. And we're the only campaign in either party that's proposed anything specific of how to do it. We're going to attract billions of dollars of private investment to rebuild our trains, roads, and airports, to get that train from New York City to Stanford in 30 minutes and New Haven in 60. That will make those communities much more exciting to millennials and to everybody. Well, I think the first thing we can do is determine who we are as a state. We have struggled for 50 years not understanding who we are as a state. We were always that place between New York City and Boston that was just a little bit cheaper. And then once we implemented the input income tax, we weren't a little bit cheaper. We were actually a little bit more money. And now coupled with rises and other fees and services, We've actually in some places in the state you can live for less in New York City than you can in the state of Connecticut. That's a problem for us because we don't have an identity that millennials will be drawn to to say, I want to be there, I want to live there. And because of that, we struggle at kind of defining what our place is in the United States of America and really the world when you think about it. Millennials like certain specific things. They love downtowns. So investing and working closely with our mayors across the state of Connecticut to get their downtowns and to understand that this can be and have a tremendous amount of economic derivative for, from, from development downtown is a good thing. And we ought to be helping them and working with them. Millennials are also tend to be non-traditional folks, and so they don't mind walking to work or biking to work or uh, taking Uber or things like that. In fact, if all of you remember when you were growing up, the number one thing you could do was get your driver's license. That was the big moment in your life where you had freedom from your home. Nowadays, driver license is nice, but not the end of the world if they don't get it till they're 18 or 21. And that's because they're using other modes of transportation. We've got to adjust and recognize to that. And finally, um, I think uh, we can uh, change a little bit about who we are by changing the cost of what it is to live here. And that's why cutting and reducing the income tax is so critical. Young people who have their college degree from UConn or Westcon or wherever they went to are not going to stay in the state when they can't find a job, and the job that they do find pays less, and they're paying a tremendous amount of taxes, and if they happen to save some retirement money, that's going to be taxed to death as well. They're being recruited by states all over the United States of America, and they're not stupid, and they're leaving. We've got to be able to redevelop our tax structure to say to the millennials, like any group or, of people coming through the pipeline, that we want you here, we want you to stay here, and we want you to spend here. That's how we can grow our economy, and that's how we can grow the interior of our cities. You know, I recently learned that I'm right on the bubble of being a millennial. And Senator Linares and Mayor Stewart told me the other day that I was too old to be a millennial. They hurt my feelings. <laughs> but in all seriousness, I, I think how we get millennials to stay here uh, is I think that they need a young governor who understands what they're dealing with uh, and the practicality of the struggles that they're facing every single day. So many millennials are coming out of college with degrees and no jobs to go to here in the state of Connecticut. They're buried in student loan debt. They're looking for housing that's affordable, that'll give them the opportunity to save and invest so they can get ahead. 
So I think they need a governor that understands what they're going through because I share those same concerns. If I were to be elected governor of the state of Connecticut, I would assure every millennial who wants to stay here that I will work every single day to ensure that if they go through our college and university system here in Connecticut, which is among the best in the nation, I will work with our educational leaders and our businesses to guarantee that there's greater collaboration and synergy with respect to what you can major in and what jobs are available for you here in Connecticut when you graduate. Millennials are leaving our state in record numbers because there are no jobs for them to go to when they graduate here in the state of Connecticut. There are no vibrant cities for which they can live in. One of the things that I would suggest beyond reducing the tax burden, reducing utility costs, having transit-oriented development, investing in our cities where millennials want to live, the other thing that I would look to do is develop a tax policy that provides a credit on their state taxes if they have a certain level of student loan debt to provide them the needed tax relief to help them pay down their student loans so they can afford to save money to buy a house, save money to invest back into our economy, and save money so they can realize opportunity like each and every one of us used to here in the state of Connecticut. That's what the next governor can do. And if we're gonna get millennials to vote for us in this election, I would submit to you running on a platform offering a new generation of leadership to our state to fix the problems of the past will get millennials in our corner. So I moved out to the Silicon Valley when I was about 28 years old. Uh, California is not a low cost, low regulation state if you've uh, ever been there. And why did I go out there? For the same reason that many millennials now go out to places like that. Because to work on a cool project, to have a potential to put some money in your pocket along the way and build a career to something that will take you farther down the road is not rocket science. But Connecticut doesn't have a low cost of living. It doesn't have the opportunities it used to have. So why stay in Connecticut? But let me paint two, two sides of what I see. I teach entrepreneurship and business at Sacred Heart University. Sorry, fearful to you. And um, um, I was teaching a class not long ago, 40 graduating seniors. At the beginning of the class, before I started lecturing, I said, raise your hand if you see yourself in Connecticut a year after graduation. Out of 40 people, one person raised her hand, and she was from Bethel. That's the downside. But let's talk about the upside, because Max Reese lives there, West Hartford. West Hartford is booming if you haven't been there. I mean, people are, you know, it costs a lot to live there, restaurants, everything that we attribute with kind of millennial living. Why? Because Pratt & Whitney's hiring engineers, and the engineers want to live there. I encourage you to go there this weekend. It will make you feel good about Connecticut. It really will. So that's what I believe what's so important to my five-step plan to 300,000 jobs over eight years, other than making it more affordable, making our government more efficient, making it easier to start a business, addressing education and infrastructure. Step five gets into, we've got to build a Roosevelt Island project like, like Bloomberg did in New York. My day one, other than those two things, targeted tax reforms and spending cuts, I will put out an RFP to ask what applied research university in Connecticut or outside Connecticut wants to come here to participate in building our Roosevelt Island project around either advanced manufacturing, finance and insurance, or healthcare delivery. And I will fight to build one because what Bloomberg did was get Cornell to come from Ithaca, Technion to come from Israel, partner with Google, Facebook, and Uber. He put in 100 million, they brought a billion dollars, it's called financial leverage. And in six years, they built 2.2 million square feet of a new city, hospital, residential, retail. That attracted millennials who get educated and they live there now. This isn't rocket science, but we have to understand that cities are our future, and there are models out there that have made other cities successful. We just have to do what Hartford doesn't do, which is execute on things. So I, I do have to admit, I'm, even, I'm not even anywhere near close to being a millennial. <laughs> I missed it by about 30 years. Uh, but I am an example of what Connecticut used to offer its young people. Uh, my mom and dad never went to school. My dad ran the scoreboard at the Yale Bowl for about uh, 40 years. Um, I like to tell people, I used to show people like Ned Lamont to his seat when I ushered on a Saturday afternoon at the Yale Bowl. Um, but they valued an education. Um, and I remember when my mom went back to work, it was World War III in our house because the father was supposed to provide back in those days. And my mom said, I'm going to go and I'm going to save money for the kids' education. 
I went to the public schools in North Haven, and you know what? My parents put me through Fairfield without any loans. They put one of my sisters through Yale, another through Albertus Magnus, and another through UConn. I said earlier, within three months of graduating from this institution, I was working up in Hartford. I went, met my wife Amy there, Price Waterhouse. We used to go out to Whalers games. It was a vibrant city. The kids today do not have that opportunity. How are we going to keep millennials here? By creating the same opportunity that I had when I was growing up. And you know what it gets down to? Fundam I'm going to sound like a broken record, but fundamentally sound tax policy. The beginning of the end for this state was 1991 and that state income tax, out of control spending, which reduced the level of jobs, which brought the cities down. We need to get back to what this place was in 1984 when I graduated from Fairfield. We need someone with the experience, with the depth, and with the understanding of how to make this thing work, and it's exactly what I'm gonna do when I'm your next governor. Thank you all very much. Uh, Max Reese has the next question. Thank you. That applause, I assume, was for me asking my question. <laughs> um, uh, uh, the president of Fairfield University said uh, in his opening remarks that just because a university has a private charter does not mean that it does not have a civic duty. Where do the state's private universities fit in when it comes to this economic future that each of you have described tonight? Mark Bowden, that's you. Yeah. Well, I, listen, I think they have uh, a tremendous value and tremendous economic input into our state. Uh, the fact that the, all of these are engines of uh, an innovation and engines of creativity, and we ought to be encouraging more uh, development here at Fairfield U, as well as at Sacred Heart and Quinnipiac and other schools throughout the state of Connecticut. Um, we have got to be able to wrestle to the ground the cost of higher education. That's an issue for our young people. We've talked about millennials here tonight, but notwithstanding cost, this is a fine, wonderful institution, and certainly the state of Connecticut ought to be partnering with it. Um, but I will tell you that until we're understanding the impact of tuition on families, and we, ha we are in a t tuition bubble right now that will come crashing down upon us very soon, um, where people can't pay their loans back, won't be able to pay their loans back, choose not to pay their loans back, and what will happen is uh, that that fund of money will eventually uh, go bankrupt as it's come precariously close before to doing that. So we've got to get the cost of accessing a university like this down, and I know we work through scholarships. I know that there's a scholarship program that's available that's been taken away from uh, Fairfield. We ought to reopen that so all universities in the state of Connecticut can participate. Um, these places are absolutely outstanding and certainly are a jewel uh, in our crown of the state. I truly believe that the cost of higher education and the impact of students being able to repay student loan debt will become the next great recession unless we work with college university leaders and our government to make sure that every Connecticut student who is looking to obtain an education without mortgaging the rest of their future can achieve that reality. I firmly believe that our colleges, our independent colleges and universities, need to work with the government to recognize that we have to deal with this problem. But more importantly, it gets back to what I said earlier. We need to have greater collaboration between our colleges and universities and the businesses that are already here and businesses perhaps outside of Connecticut that we're trying to bring here. Better collaboration upon the skill set that those businesses are looking for that our educators can provide in the form of curriculum, whether it be in a four-year education or two-year education. When we talk about the affordability of achieving a four-year degree, I will tell you, and I don't say this lightly, that our community college system is just as important to achieving those objectives as our four-year institutions here in the state of Connecticut. I can't tell you how many families that I meet that have to send their kids to a two-year community college so they can afford a four-year education in the long term. We have got to find a way to get our costs of higher education down. We've got to find a way to rely more upon independent self-governance of our colleges and universities here in Connecticut. One thing that many of us agree with is that we need to uh, eliminate the Board of Regents of higher education and allow those that govern their schools and universities govern best and come up with the strategies that work at each and every one of those schools. But you know what I think is great? The civic engagement that is happening this year when our colleges and universities are hosting these debates because it shows an eagerness and a willingness to let the people of the state of Connecticut vet the candidates seeking the state's highest office. And we have to build upon that partnership. Um, if I haven't mentioned, I have a five-step plan to 300,000 jobs over eight years. 
And universities, to tr trade schools to universities are critical to that, this institution and others. Because I don't think our governor has ever brought the business community together. And by the way, we have 24 Fortune 1000 companies who have not evicted themselves from Connecticut yet. And we have 42 trade schools to universities. The governor hasn't brought them together and basically get people to define you know, skills that are needed to build these 300,000 jobs so you can have a supply chain of trained people delivering those jobs. Let me, let me talk about two things. One, jobs for the future. Um, I was involved in starting that woman who may talk to you in your pocket, Siri. I apologize, she's not perfect. But what I've come to believe is that in the world of Google, knowledge isn't enough. Learning to do is what's important. As a kid in high school, as someone going to community college, college, and even a 50-year-old, it's all about learning to do. So I think what we have to talk to our universities and community colleges about how we create the doing of jobs. And we need to rely a lot more on apprenticeship programs than we have in the past. We only have about 7,000 people in an apprenticeship program, and most of it's on the trades. My plan has us focusing on building 50,000 apprenticeship programs around these Roosevelt Island projects. Now, how do we pay for it? It's a big problem. Once again, Rhode Island is running circles around us. They have a program called Rhode Island Promise. Through this program, you can get your associate's degree in community colleges, and they pull, for every $2.5 that they pull from Pell Grants, we pull a dollar. Why are they being more creative at basically getting the federal government to use Pell Grants to educate our kids and our government's doing nothing? So we need a lot more innovation. We need deli different delivery models about how we can deliver skills to people at different levels. And we have to bring more innovation in. Uh, Governor Mitch Daniels in Indiana, he introduced a three-year degree at the University of Purdue. You get out of school a year earlier. All parents would love that, right? So it's going to take an approach of knowing where the economy is going, having been in the industry of where, where technology is moving us, and then working with businesses and universities to make sure that we're delivering the skills from trade level up to applied research so we have a workforce here that's trained to build these 300,000 jobs. I think it depends on the kid. I mean, for me, Fairfield Uni was going here was the best thing that ever happened to me. Um, I got a Jesuit education. I learned the value of integrity. I learned the value of leadership. Um, being an accounting major wasn't the most exciting things. You know, when I went out, there weren't a lot of people impressed with that. Uh, but I learned a trade. But there's also kids that spend in $200,000 for a college education, and the return on investment for that is years, that should really be going to trade schools. And when I go to the mid mid-sized companies in this state, they are dying for basic engineering, machine tooling, and that's not to take anything away from the bigger universities. They have a place. Um, kids should go there. It's been terrific for people like me. But we shouldn't be pigeonholing kids into what they're supposed to do. Trade school, you come out with a job, you're doing very well. So the bottom line to me is to have a choice. Private universities, public universities, trade schools, and guide kids to the area that's best for them without having any preconceived notions about what you're supposed to do in life. Our 42 colleges in this state is one of the great assets that we have to rebuild a bright and great future. And it's a combination of both our private and public schools. Private schools like this, we have in Yale one of the top 10 research universities on the planet, which is a tremendous asset for us to take advantage of. There are a couple things that we need to do quite a bit better. One is to make sure, as we've talked about before, that our employers and our educators are coordinating. If you look at what's happening in Massachusetts, in Cambridge, you have a vibrant biotech community because the leadership there has brought them together. We have that same kind of opportunity, not only at Yale and New Haven, but we've made a tremendous investment at UConn in Farmington, and we have tremendous potential there. The second, though, is improving affordability, and that is the 800-pound gorilla here. And I believe that introducing market-based mechanisms here is important. So Goodwin College, and we've got a couple of people here, uh, they can train somebody at half the cost of a community college. And what they said to our legislators is, we can train somebody for about $8,000 that takes $16,000 for a community college. We can get about 5500 from a Pell Grant 
and all that we want for the last two and a half thousand is to have a share of their state income tax. That sounds like a pretty great deal to me, but this state said no because we have a no layoff clause for our community colleges and this would just be an extra cost. We need to have a governor who is going to restructure those employment agreements so that we can use innovative thinking like this. For Purdue, one of the other ideas they have there is instead of just having student debt, they have an income sharing agreement, which means that the school is at risk of whether its students graduate, whether its students get a job and they get a job, they can earn enough money to then pay it back. It's that kind of innovative thinking, shared responsibility that we can bring to this state to take us to the next level. Thank you very much. I, I will just uh, let everyone know as we get the timing that uh, there's now a little bit of a disparity in the amount of time left. And Mr. Obstetnik, you have uh, about a minute and a 15 seconds left, just so that you know to be uh, uh, concise with your answers. Um, and the next question is from Mark Pazniukas. Um, you've all, uh, both here tonight in, uh, on your websites and on the campaign trail, you have all spoken in detail about um, the shortcomings of transportation in Connecticut. What needs to be done to maintain the infrastructure and hopefully improve it? But I will confess um, a little less certain about how you would pay for that. I, I know what you're all against. You're against waste, fraud, inefficiency, and for God's sakes, tolls. But for a moment, I would ask you to humor me, as well as anybody else who's studied this, and let's assume for a moment you're going to need some more revenue at some point. What is the fairest and most reliable source of revenue that the state of Connecticut should go for to maintain and improve our transportation infrastructure? Mr. Herbst? Yes, sir. I knew you were going to ask that question, Mark. Um, here's what I think we need to do. Um, so you must have a good answer. I do. I do. Um, I will talk about revenue first, but then I want to talk about the underlying problem. One of the things that I have suggested in previous debates is that I would insist upon, if I'm elected governor, performing an asset inventory of all of our state-owned property, facilities, things that we are not using. And I would explore looking at a sale leaseback option for those assets and properties and dedicating that revenue to a fixed fund I'm not going to use the term lockbox because the people in Hartford don't like that term. They don't like to abide by it. But we have to have a fixed uh, revenue source that cannot be rated, and I would explore that. But let's get to the underlying problem. You know, when people talk about tolls, here's what I've learned. In Connecticut, especially with the Hartford insiders, the more money you give them, the more they will find a way to misappropriate it. That's what they told you when you got a gas tax and they increased it and increased it again. And they said that's going to fund transportation. Just last year, transportation advocates told the governor, give us an additional half percent in the sales tax. Don't cap us on bonding and we'll be able to fund all of our transportation projects. Budget's adopted in October. In February, the governor announces the cancellation of $4 billion in infrastructure projects because the special transportation fund does not have the capacity to fund them. This is an issue important to Fairfield County. And if I'm elected governor, before we start talking about revenue enhancements, I'm going to insist that we do a forensic audit of the Special Transportation Fund. We need to focus on priorities. 95, Metro North, Merritt Parkway, they have never been as bad as they are now. We have to start focusing on priorities, not busways to nowhere from New Britain to Hartford, but the things that we have to invest in to fix our roads, highways, and bridges. And we have to insist that we have a capital plan that focuses on these core priorities and a governor that's going to appoint a DOT commissioner that doesn't increase operational encumbrances by over 60% in an eight-year term. It's time to get back to focusing on the basics. It's time to focus on what we need to fix. And we do not need to always focus on additional revenue sources. Connecticut has a spending problem. And it's time we start spending responsibly and start investing in our infrastructure so our residents can get to and from work without sitting in gridlock. Thank you very much. <laughs> Mr. Sidnick? In the interest of time, I stand shoulder to shoulder with Tim on that. I couldn't have said it better. Give us a second to calculate that answer, uh, like, please, Mr. Stefanowski. Can I do a, a time check quick? Oh, good. Maybe I could sell some of my time back to Steve. 
here, here, here we go. Uh, this is an area we need to be realistic. Uh, we've got budget deficits coming out of our ears. We are not going to find the money in the state budget to fix our infrastructure. It's simply not going to happen. I'll get this economy moving with a tax cut and bringing jobs in, but we can't get it moving fast enough to, to get a surplus in the budget to fix the roads. It's all about the private sector. Other states have done it. There's a ton of money sitting out there waiting to invest roads, bridges, airports. I met with a team a few weeks ago. They'd love, Tim mentioned it, we'd, they'd love to do a sale lease back on the XL Center. So what do we do? We give it another 10, $15 million of taxpayer money to try to prop it up and sell it three years from now. They would come in, they would take over the operations, they would finance the improvements, we would get a share of the gate coming out the other side. We turn it from a cost center into a revenue center. There's a lot of things we could be doing with airports. Other, other states have done it. You privatize the airport. What's the one thing that works on I-95? The rest areas are actually pretty good with, with McDonald's and, you know, they could use to be upgraded a little bit, but they're actually pretty good. You know why? Because the private sector runs it. So why we're so fundamentally against letting these businesses in, you have to know how to deal with them. You can't give them an extraordinary rate of return, but I've been dealing with them for 30 years. We can cut a fair deal. We can turn all of these cost centers into profit centers. And while we're doing that, upgrade the infrastructure with a budget that we have right now that simply cannot afford to do it. So, and I'll just quickly say, uh, David Severin, you'd asked if this is the last question. Uh, you still have about three minutes left total. I would love to get to one more question, if possible. Mr. Herbst has used up all of his time, but uh, please, if you would. I thought okay. that was the last question. <laughs> Depends what it is. <laughs> Not sure what to do okay. about that, but. So on this topic, this is of uh, critical importance to upgrade our transportation infrastructure. One of the competitive advantages for our state, and I think about this as a business person, of what attracted families and businesses here, it's our location between New York and Boston, gateway to New England, that 600 miles of coastline. But it's only valuable if you can get here. And again, I hear a lot of headlines of, yeah, let's make it better, let's bring in private business. We have put out a 16-page proposal on our website, davidstemmerman.com, about this issue. I've spoken with Governor Jeb Bush's key advisor in putting this place in Florida as they have rebuilt their transportation infrastructure. I spoke with the leading attorney at Skadden Arps who ran their practice, who worked in the Trump administration about how we will do this. I've spoken with a person who's run tens of billions of dollars of transportation infrastructure fund that owns airports, roads, and uh, 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 trains all over the world. And so we know that we, this can be done. I've spoken with people in New York about how we would coordinate. These are the kinds of practical pieces of how we're going to do this that's going to go again from a soundbite to a solution. And I'm confident that with that kind of what we talk about outside the box leadership, that kind of detailed work, that in a place like Bridgeport, when we get the train from there to New York City in 45 minutes, when we add one or two lanes to 95, we reverse them during rush hour, and we turn Sikorsky into a major regional airport, this city is going to take off. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Tim, I want to get this out because I've got it out at every single debate, so just jump on it when you get a second. I will strap my body across I-95 before I allow tolls to be put in there. And I will not let you hurt yourself. No tolls. <laughs> All right. Um, look, uh, just quickly, um, we have an issue of culture in the legislature. The General Assembly has a culture issue led by the Democrats where any money they get in, they will spend. And so what we've got to do first is change our culture. So allowing them to generate new revenue, collect new revenue, you know, public-private partnerships are going to want to be paid back. This can require fees to be paid. All that stuff can't happen unless we can have a sea change of culture change uh, within the General Assembly. The first thing we can do is take the costs out of the transportation fund that don't belong in there. For example, we fund TANF out of the transportation fund. We fund other things out of the transportation fund. So we have to have a clean fund to be able to understand exactly what we're funding. And then what we need to do is prioritize which projects should go first. 
And we can't do that alone. A governor can't do that alone. We need to re-implement the Transportation Strategy Board of business leaders across Connecticut that pick the projects and say that will have the biggest impact on our economy. Let's do that first. And not let, let's do a, you know, a, an intersection way out in the corner of the state that gets three cars a day. Let's widen 80, uh, parts of 95. Let's widen parts of I-84. Let's speed up our trains. Let's do all those things that will get our economy going. So every decision that has to be made has to be made about which initiative will generate the most jobs. Thank you very much. Um, I, we've got another question from Vanessa, and it's going to go to Steve Sitnik. And, and again, you've got about a minute and 10 seconds left. So many of you agree that Connecticut needs great public schools to attract young families and build talent for high-skilled jobs. At the same time, you want to cut spending and taxes that help support educational funding. Too many of our city students are already far behind and sit in classrooms with limited resources. How do you make sure that all students in Connecticut get a great education and not just the kids in the wealthier, mostly white suburbs? Yeah, important question. Look, I think it's, it, if you look at the 169 towns of Connecticut, they're roughly, I think, 160 school districts. We have some regional school districts. The ones that work well, we have to keep control as close to the student as possible. Let those school systems continue to do what they do well. The ones that are, have a little more difficulty, I think we have to provide more oversight to make sure, you know, what is it that they are delivering for the money that they're taking because we cannot keep throwing more money at a problem that's not solving the solution. And the hardest thing I see here is that for kids who are going to a suburban school, we see how they tend to do well. Why are we going to keep spending more money on school systems where kids there pick really great parents but don't have the same level of service? We may need to go into looking at control boards that come in and look at education systems at a few towns, but it doesn't start with throwing more money at the problem. I go back to what I learned in the Navy. It's not what you expect, it's what you inspect. And we've got to do a lot more inspecting of all, a lot of our systems in Connecticut, education, transportation, uh, welfare, and so forth. Thank you very much. I think it gets down to choice. Uh, I went to a public high school in North Haven High. It was actually pretty good. Um, there are some terrific charter schools out there. I was at Amistad Academy in New Haven last week. It's amazing what these, these programs are doing. Some of the magnet schools are very good. So I think it's about finding the right allocation of money. And in fairness to the towns, they have to have some certainty around their education budget. You can't go into a year and have the rug pulled out from you under in the middle of the year. I also think we don't talk enough about the family influence on kids. You know, if I got up at 7 a.m. and I had a bit of a sniffle, my mom kicked me you know where and said get to school. And I think the family needs to be more involved. We need to provide more choice. We need to invite the private sector in because 99 times out of 100, the private sector is better at running something than the government is. But it's all about having different options for different kids and leaving that autonomy to the towns to manage, not dictating it out of Hartford. Can I just ask you, because you have a little bit of time left, what does private sector education look like in public schools? What, what does that look like in your mind? Well, there's some very good charter schools um, you know, that come in and uh, provide the right curriculum. Some of them are focused on certain areas, um, but we need to start looking at all areas. Look at the Department of Motor Vehicles. That's classic exhibit A of how the public sector is horrible at running something. There's a cottage industry now. You show up early, you get a ticket, and then you sell it to somebody later in the day for 20 bucks on the way out. That's the perfect example of how the private sector would be infinitely, I may start doing it myself. To finance, I'm just kidding. To finance, it, perfect example. It, Bring the private sector in. With, with about 45 seconds left, is it fair to say that educating students in an urban school district isn't like going to the DMV, that it's different? Isn't like what? It isn't like going to the DMV. I mean, these are two very different things, educating it's kids. It's very different, but the disciplines pay for performance, outcome-based teaching. <laughs> All of those things from the private sector would be yell, well utilized in our schools right now. The disciplines, the similar disciplines apply. Thank you, sir. So in this area, as in others, I'd look to see what's worked elsewhere. Massachusetts faced a very similar dilemma 20 years ago, where not only were their top schools not as good as they should be, but the achievement gap was unacceptably great. And I think here it is immoral. They did two things. The first thing is they raised their standards. They don't use Common Core because it's common. They set the highest standards in the country. The second is they had accountability. There's accountability for students to improve, and there's accountability for their teachers and principals. 
and ultimately for a school district, if a school district fails to, to educate its children, it loses the privilege of local control. The last piece is I do believe in competition and markets. And so I believe in what's called a student-centered funding formula, which means within a public school district, the same resources should go to a school, whether it's the local neighborhood school, a charter, a magnet, a career and technical school, and every family should be given a voice and a choice of where they go to school. And so those schools that do a wonderful job, like Amistad Academy, will get more students and grow, and those that are not serving our children either will need to do a better job or will close. Thank you, sir. I have a uh, master's degree in educational psychology. I taught high school for 14 years, and it's interesting because I never saw a bad student. I saw bad parents, I saw bad institutional structures, bad decisions made, bad teachers, bad guidance counselors, you pick it. But I never saw a bad student. So if we start off with a fundamental belief that every child it should be willing and ready to learn, we could just do some very basic things that will get better outcomes. One, we stay out of successful districts. They're already doing that. Why get involved with them and be involved with uh, what they're doing at the local level? Two, we gotta improve competition in the education marketplace. Danbury is putting in its first uh, charter school and we're excited about the outcomes that they're gonna achieve there. Three, we've gotta make sure that our graduates come out ready to work. This is a huge problem where somebody may be academically very smart but simply can't function in the workplace because they didn't learn things like come early, stay late, do what the boss tells you to do, those kinds of things. Those are basic skills, but critically important in developing your workforce. And one of the best things that we did in Danbury is we have a proposal that we're still working on to allow access to high-speed internet for every home in our city for $15 a month. One gig up and one gig down. And after five years, it becomes $5 a month. That's where the state can partner and help close Thank the you achievement very much. gap. Thank you, sir. I, I will say that the candidates did an exceptional job of timing out all of their answers. Mr. Stefanowski, you have 37 seconds left, which you can either continue to use for 37 seconds or you can donate back to Fairfield University. <laughs> what a move. What a move. Uh, but if I sing, can I sing a quick song, our alma mater? <laughs> if, you know, if you know the uh, alma mater, people look tired, I'm gonna donate it. I'm gonna donate it. You donate it, thank you very much. Uh, we have time then for one minute closing statements from each of the candidates, and we'll start once again with Mark Bowden. Thank you, and thank you, Fairfield U, for having this event. It's my honor and privilege to be here. We started off this discussion today, this evening, talking about being the envy of New England. That's what we used to be. Under a Bowden administration, when we're done, we will once again be the envy of New England. Being an elected official is vastly different than running a business or running an organization. You have to answer to 3.2 million people every day, try to bring people together to solve the problems that face our state and bring a consensus amongst our, leg our legislature. That's work, and I'm excited to begin to work tomorrow to do that. We've got profound plans on our website. I ask that you go there and check them out, and certainly look forward to earning your support on August 14th, where we're gonna be the envy of New England. Thank you very much, Mr. Herbst. After eight years of failed leadership, one thing I know is that our state needs a fighter to go to Hartford to turn things around. I did that in Trumbull. Balancing eight budgets, reducing taxes twice, reforming a broken pension system, upgrading a credit rating, investing in a nationally ranked school system that has been the envy of not only this region, but the state of Connecticut. We need to change the way we're doing business in Hartford, but we're not going to do that by sending the same people back to sit in different chairs. During the course of this campaign, I have talked about one word which will determine the choice that you will make next Tuesday, and that word is trust. Who can Republican primary voters trust to not only prosecute the campaign against Ned Lamont, which will lead us to victory in November, but who can Republican primary voters trust to act like a Republican and govern like a Republican come January of 2019? I did not find my value system in a poll or focus group. With me, what you see is what you get. And if you choose me to be your nominee next Tuesday, I will work honestly without fear or favor to do what is right for all of the Thank people of Connecticut. Much. Thank you. Mr. Absidnik. Yeah. Well, thank you all for coming again tonight. Look, uh, in the submarine service, we're all trained to be firefighters. And we're all trained to run into the fire. And Connecticut's on fire. 
And to run into any fire, you have to have the experience, the plan, and the character to put out the fire. I grew up in Stanford. I attended the US Naval Academy. I did my submarine service down the road in Groton. I've started really great companies, changing people's lives. And that's what we need going forward, to inspire ourselves to be in this state and have our kids here with us. You have to have a plan to address it. My five-step plan to 300,000 jobs in eight years is detailed and specific and is the roadmap we need to go forward. In the end, it comes down to character. My grandfather used to always tell me that when you apply heat to iron, you get steel. And I'm a battle-tested, hardened piece of steel who has high empathy for the people of Connecticut. I'd be honored to earn your vote on August 14th and be your next governor. Thank you. Mr. Stefanowski. So thanks for listening tonight. It's good to be back home. Um, our state is in an absolute crisis. And if you honestly believe that the best option is to hire another politician to get us out of a mess that the politicians created, then I'm not your guy. What I am is I'm the only person on either side of the aisle that's run an organization anywhere near the size of the state of Connecticut. I'm a business person. I'm an outsider. I know how to negotiate. I know how to take out cost. I know how to build alliances. And I know how to deliver on a plan. I will rip cost out of the state budget like you've never seen in your life. And we'll use those cost savings to get rid of the income tax and to stimulate economic growth and bring our state back to what it used to be. But we all need to rally together. We need to get a majority in the House. We need to get a majority in the Senate. We need to beat Ned Lamont or, God help us, Joe Gannum. Thank you very much. And we need to turn this state around. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much. And David Stemmerman. What we need if we're going to achieve any of our aspirations that we've talked about today is not only to elect a Republican governor, to elect majorities in both houses of the legislature, and to govern with a moral authority of telling the people of this state what it is we need to do. We need to bring everybody together. And just a couple of weekends ago in neighboring Bridgeport, I was marching in the Puerto Rican Day Parade. And I can assure you there are more Republicans on stage than I shook hands with on a five-mile parade route. But when I called out to everyone, Salvavamos Connecticut, todos, juntos, everyone was cheering. We will save Connecticut, everyone together. We all know our state is in trouble. We all know that we need more jobs. We all want lower taxes. What we need is a leader who will speak honestly about our challenges, who will inspire us to be our better selves. Join me. Let's save Connecticut. Thank you. About five and, and with that, we end our debate. I want to thank Fairfield University and CCIC for putting on this event. I want to thank you for being a lovely audience. Please go out and vote next week. I want to thank uh, our candidates, Mark Bouton, Tim Herbst, Steve Obsidnik, Bob Stefanowski, and David Stemmerman. A nice round of applause for them and to our panelists. Good night.